We are continuing Unit 5 Thermodynamics, and the main emphasis today is how heat transfers. There are actually several different ways that we can transfer heat from one object to another, all of which are in here, ladies and gentlemen. We have the three R, radiation. We have that going on in here right now. Con we do. Convection. Convection's happening in here right now. And the topic of today's discussion is conduction. Conduction. So one of the things that obviously you can see on the board here is that we're going to talk about this idea called conduction. I don't want you to write down everything on the board as you see it. As a matter of fact, I want you just to pay attention today because I want you to, you can, you can watch the video online over and over and take notes later if you really want to. You can print the notes offline. What I want is for you to engage today in conversation because everything we're going to be talking about is going to require your attention. So just sit back and pay attention today to what I have to say. And then if you have questions, we can hopefully have a nice discussion about what it is we're, we're going to see today. So we're going to see several different things. We're going to see several different things. All right. Now, the first thing you should understand about conduction is that we need to define it. And then once we define it, we can look at several different examples and how it relates to things we use in real life. So on the board, you see that we have this idea of conduction. Conduction is the transfer of heat through contact, through contact, touch. But things don't just touch, OK? For instance, if I put my left hand together and my right hand together, OK, they're touching. And technically, there could be heat transfer, but it, we have to look at it not at the big level, where I have a, a left hand and a right hand. We have to zoom all the way in. Remember, we're dealing with middle school chemistry here. We've already talked about the periodic table and elements and atoms. The main approach to understanding how heat moves, we have to look at the atoms. It all has to do with the atoms. And so what you have to understand is that this is not just touching. That atoms are always in a constant state of what? Motion. Yeah. Motion. motion. Oh, absolutely. Oh, beautiful. Yes. They're in a constant state of motion. Atoms are always moving. They're vibrating. They're, woo, they're wiggling. Okay. Sometimes they're wiggling a little bit. Sometimes they're going crazy. But they're always in a constant state of motion. And so when you put two atoms next to each other that are moving, they collide. It's through that collision that conduction takes place, okay? But it's not heat energy always. Sometimes it's other types of energy. Sometimes it's sound energy. Sometimes it's electrical energy. Sometimes, sometimes, okay, it's light energy. So what we see here is that the transfer of heat is through contact, but contact's not a very good word. Really, what we should be looking at is it's the collision of atoms, and through that collision, the transfer of kinetic energy. So conduction is the transfer of kinetic energy through collision. That's what conduction is. It's the transfer of kinetic energy, the energy of motion, through collisions. Okay. Let me give you an example of this. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and put on a hard hat. I'm going to need... Um, Jackson, can you please go stand by the cupboards over there? Actually, okay, Jackson, thank you. I'm going to put on this hard hat. And because of the sake of this demonstration, um, to protect myself, of course, I'm going to need to put on these Hulk hands. Actually, Jackson, you better put on the Hulk hands. <laughs> yeah. Because you're going you're gonna to need to protect yourself. And... Um, There's something inside the Hulk hands. Well, you know, just, just for the sake of, of you know... <laughs> okay, there we go. All right, so what we have going on, Jackson Donkey. represents, ladies and gentlemen, an atom that is sort of at rest, okay? He has a little bit of energy. You have a little bit of energy, okay? So how, what, how would we show that? You have a little bit of energy. <clears throat> so we wiggle a little bit, okay? There we go. He's wiggling a little bit. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I am an atom that's got a lot of energy, okay? I'm moving like crazy. I'm bop, popping up and down. I'm hopping, I'm hopping, I'm hopping. I'm, I'm just ready to go, okay? Now, which one of us has more kinetic energy? You. I have more kinetic energy. If you took 
and, and let's say I'm a single atom. Let's say there was a bunch of atoms around. If you had to compare us by temperature, which one would have a greater temperature? Yeah. I do because I'm moving faster, right? I have more kinetic energy. If I take the average of all the energy, I have more of it. And so I am going faster and I am hotter. Okay, so I'm getting ready to go. I've got lots of energy. I've got lots of energy. And we are really close to each other. As a matter of fact, we're atoms. We're right next door. We're neighbors, just like the pan and the stove. He is a cold pan. I am a hot stove. Okay? And so I'm going, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going. I'm looking for an atom. I'm looking for an atom. And I go on, and I collide. I knew it. He moved. Now I bounced back. Okay? Because I didn't lose everything. I got going and I got electrical energy from the from the outlet and it's heating me back up. And so then I go over again. Okay? okay? And I bounce back. And he moved again. Okay? Thank you, James. That was the best demonstration ever. And so, that is what's happening at the atomic level. You guys look at this. When, and this is, maybe you missed it, because it was kind of funny. <laughs> but what happened was, when I hit him, did he stay moving a little bit? Yeah. No. Jackson absorbed some energy, kinetic energy, and moved a lot. Maybe for a brief moment, <laughs> but he did. He moved a lot. What happened momentarily to his kinetic energy? It, it spiked. And if his kinetic energy spiked, and let's say this is happening trillions of times a second from the stove to the pan, overall, what's going to happen to Jackson over time? Yeah. He's going to gain energy and have a higher temperature. Oh, that's beautiful. He's going to gain energy and have a higher temperature. You just saw the transfer of heat energy through contact of atoms. So you basically saw the transfer of heat or kinetic energy through collision. You just saw conduction. Okay, this is what's happening. Now, when I see this happening, let's zoom in here a little bit. I want you to, if, if you are, if you do have a pencil and paper out, it might be to your advantage to at least draw the pan and the stove. You have to think about them, okay? You really need to think about them in terms of um, the atoms, okay? You need to think about the atoms of the pan and the atoms of the stove. The pan is in contact with the stove, but in reality, if you were to zoom way in, they're not actually touching. The only time atoms ever really touch is through collisions. Now, if you have two things that are of equal energy, they're just going to kind of bounce into each other. They're going to bounce back and forth. You get a transfer of energy when one atom has a lot more kinetic energy than another. And so when they collide, the difference is huge. Just like you saw when I collided as a stove atom with Jackson, who was a pan atom. Okay, and I transferred kinetic energy to him. Um, Jackson, question? Right, and then you have fresh eggs, exactly. Okay. All right, I want you to take a look. I want you to take a look over here at this big beaker of water. What I've been doing is I've been heating this rock on a hot plate. Now, this is a metamorphic rock. What, what is okay? that metamorphic rock is a rock that had, was developed deep inside the earth. And under lots of heat and pressure, it folded the rock into a very dense, very dense, um, hard substance. Not all rocks are this way. We have igneous rocks, which crystallize from magma or lava. We have metamorphic rocks, which form deep inside the earth under lots of heat and pressure. Like in lava? And then um, they don't necessarily form in lava. They just, the earth is so hot and there's so much pressure from all of the mountains and the crust and everything weighing down on it that it actually folds solid rock like you would fold paper. Obsidian? Obsidian is an igneous rock that forms on the surface of earth. And then there's sedimentary rocks, which also form... How do you get that rock? Near the surface of the earth. Uh, this is actually Mrs. Miller's rock. And so um, what I've been doing is I've been heating this rock. And so it's been getting really warm, okay? And so what I'm going to do 
is I'm going to place this very hot rock, okay, because it has a lot of kinetic energy inside it right now. The atoms are moving faster than they were because I've been pumping energy into it. I'm going to put the rock in this relatively lukewarm water. What do you think is going to happen? And don't say the water is going to get warmer. We kind of can already tell that. Tell me how it's going to get warmer. Okay? Savannah? What's lukewarm? Lukewarm means that it's not cold, but it's not really hot. It's kind of meh temperature. Okay? Not uncomfortably cold, but not uncomfortable, not comfortably warm either. Isabel? I was going to answer your question. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so the atoms in the rock are moving really fast. But what happens when I put them in the water? There's going to be a what that takes place. There's going to be what, Isabella? It's slow in energy. Okay, think about the, a word that it's coal and then it ends in ision. Collision! Okay, there's going to be collision, sure. So the rock atoms being fast, having lots of energy, are going to collide with water molecules. And we're going to see a transfer of what type of energy? kinetic energy, and as a result, there's going to be so many collisions and so much energy transfer that what's going to happen overall to the average kinetic energy of the water? It'll go up. It'll go up, and we would then say that its temperature increases. increases. Okay, so I have this hot rock. Is Hopefully that, it's hot enough. Let's is that see. rock too hot to touch? Yes, it is. Oh, it could probably give you like okay. a... Okay. <gasps> what would change color? Okay. So what we see happening, first of all, is as soon as it touched the water, it caused some of the water to turn into what? Water Steam, water vapor, yeah. Because there was so much energy transferred so quickly. Can we do that again? Okay. Now, what should be happening to the temperature of the water right now? Increasing. Should be increasing. And if I stick my finger in there, yeah, it's got a quite a bit warmer. Now it's warm. It's not lukewarm. It's warm, okay? And so, yeah, we see this temperature increase inside the water. Be through conduction, because the atoms of the rock came in contact with the molecules of the water, they collided, they transferred energy, and thus they all became warm. Now, if the rock transfers energy to the water, what's going to happen to the temperature of the rock? It's going to get cold. Decrease. Okay, it's going to decrease, because now the rock had a certain amount of energy, it lost some of that energy, and so now its average kinetic energy is going to go down. So the water's average kinetic energy goes up, the rock's kinetic energy goes down, until they are both at the same what? Temperature. Temperature. When this happens, ladies and gentlemen, we call this equilibrium. That means that the temperature of the rock, the temperature of the water are the same, and the transfer of energy is no longer taking place. There's still collisions, but you're, they're kind of just bouncing back and forth. They're, they're not really, there's not really one that's hitting hard and transferring energy. Emma. When you look at the, like, there's, like, stuff coming off the rock. Yeah. And it looks like, almost like gel, like, kind of like gel. I don't know. It looks like, like steam underwater. It water. doesn't look like water, what the water used to look like. Like, Air it's bubbles? coming off. It's, I don't think and you there. can only mm. see it. I can see it when you look at it. Certain there like might be a transfer of, of minerals or something like that. I mean, there could be. There could be uh, things on side of the rock that are that are discoloring the water a little bit. I mean, there's a lot of why things. Why does the rock change color too? Like why is well, it, it just it got hot, and so sometimes when things heat up, they change color. It could be a rearrangement of particles, though the odds are that's not the case because rocks have to get pretty hot before we can really change their composition. Okay, that's why most of that takes place inside the Earth. All right, I'm gonna stop that real quick, and we're gonna kind of come over here to the screen. And we're going to take a look at an explanation of, how, of what's really happening here uh, between the pan and the stove atom. Okay? Like I said, I'm not going to do too many more. No, I'm just going to kind of explain this to you. Okay, take a look here at the stove atom, kind of in the center of the screen. Notice it has lots of red lines around it. That means that it's moving fast with greater motion, has more kinetic energy. Then the pan atom, well, it has only one little line around it on each side, which means that it's still moving because everything is in motion. But it's not moving as much. And so as a result, we could say the pan atom has less kinetic energy. The stove atom has large movement, higher temperature. The pan atom has small movement. Therefore, we could say it's probably at a lower temperature. 
And so when, what's happening here is when we heat up the stove using electrical energy from the wall, okay, the two are going to collide. They might collide more than once, like you saw in the, the demonstration with Jackson. So when they collide, a small transfer of energy takes place, and kinetic energy is transferred from the high energy particle, the one that's moving crazy, to the low energy particle. This, again, is the essence of conduction. This is the essence of it. It's through a collision that energy is transferred. It's through the collision that energy is transferred. Now, over here on the screen, okay, over here on the screen, okay, let me bring this up here. We have, okay, a couple of things on the board. All right, and I'm going to go ahead and just take a picture of it here real quick. You know, it doesn't do me much good if I have gloves on. Let's go ahead and take a picture so that it stays up on the board and can be recorded. Okay, so here we go. There it is. And it's going to stay up there and it's going to stay recorded. It's not as easy to see, but you can kind of draw your attention to the board real quick. Uh, I will in a little while. You can go back later. We'll have time. This lesson isn't going to take the full period today. Okay. There are really two types of materials that aid in conduction. There are really two types of materials. There are conductors and there are insulators. Okay, and so conductors allow energy flow. They allow it. Hence the reason that we call them conductors, because they allow that movement of energy. Not only do they allow energy to flow, but because energy has to be transferred through collision. Bouncy, 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 bounce. Exactly. Because it has to be transferred through collision, there's greater atomic movement. Okay. If I couldn't collide with Jackson, there would have been no energy transfer. But because I was able to move, because I had free movement and collided with Jackson, I was able to transfer energy to him. So conductors allow energy flow, but not only that, they have greater atomic movement. There are certain things that naturally, because of the way God made them, have this ability. Metals have this ability, and water have this ability. They really do. Okay? So if we look here, okay? Okay, well, it's going to be like this. Conductors allow energy flow. They allow greater atomic movement. Metals and water are a great example of this. Then there are insulators. Let's throw that up on the screen. Insulators restrict energy flow. The way they do that, they don't let the atoms move. It's kind of like chaining them in place. Oftentimes, this is because of the way that they are constructed. All right? Certain substances like carbon, for instance, or in diamonds, the way it's constructed, it doesn't let the atoms move a whole lot. And so as a result, it doesn't allow energy, electricity, other forms of energy to move freely. Okay, so at, uh, diamonds are great insulators. Okay, now I don't think you'd be using diamonds in your walls. First of all, um, your house would probably get robbed. And second of all, there's not enough of it to go around. Okay, probably get robbed if your house was made of diamonds. Okay, so that it was well insulated. Okay, yes, Emma. A sweatshirt? Yeah. Right, so the way that sweatshirts and clothes are constructed, they don't allow energy to leave. Now, sometimes you wear some clothing, it doesn't let moisture out either. And so you might, uh, certain things don't let moisture out, so you sweat a lot inside them. Uh, now, Under Armour, how many of you own some sort of Under Armour? Under Armour actually lets your body breathe. So it lets moisture out, but it keeps heat in. So it's actually, that's why it's so expensive. It actually has to be engineered that way. Okay, so there is a whole industry that's devoted to creating good conductors and good insulators. Okay, take a look here at these. this. This is a high transmission power line. You showed us this. I did. Inside is metal. It's a good conductor. On the outside is rubber. Okay, a good insulator. It keeps the electricity and the heat inside the wire. Whoa. Well, so that it can't be damaged by the elements or that so that it doesn't, release any of its electricity um, if it comes in contact with something. 
or shock birdie, sort of. <laughs> That's yeah. Because if you because there's all right, just so that I'll answer your question, but it doesn't really relate to this so much. Uh, you have to complete a circuit for electricity to flow. When a bird stands on a power line, no circuit is being completed. If a bird touches the ground, there's what we call potential difference, which means there's a high electricity here, there's very little electricity here, and electricity sees that as an opportunity to escape. So it goes through whatever's connecting it to the ground. So if a bird touched a high power, touched a high transmission power line and touched the ground, it would pop. Okay? <laughs> Okay, that's what would happen. Okay, Shh. let's come back real quick. I only have about three, three more minutes, hey? Ladies and gentlemen, this is the last part of our notes today. And this is what we call, this is why metals work so well, all right? We saw that metals and water conduct electricity and heat and energy well. Insulators are things that are not metal because of the way that they're structured atomically. And then air. Why do you think air doesn't conduct heat or electricity well? Yeah. It's gas, and the particles are spread apart. Spread apart. Very good. And they're spread so far apart that they can't collide easily. That's why solids are some of the best conductors. Absolutely. All right. Metals. Okay, if you, if you look at the, the, what we're looking at here, the diagram, this is called an electron C. This is called the electron C model. Like we have the, the black C and the red C, and, okay, the dead C. This is the electron C, and what it is is it helps us describe why metals are such good conductors of not only heat, but electricity as well. So first of all, you have to understand that this is like a metal wire that you're looking at. I've identified it as a metal. And inside this wire, okay, are the nucleus of atoms. Let's say it's a copper wire, so it would be a nucleus of a copper atom. Okay? The nucleus of any atom is always positively charged. And so hence you see these big positively charged nuclei in the atom. Please understand the nucleus is in actually incredibly small. Okay? But for the sake of our demonstration, it's very, 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 very tiny. It's very dense and in the center of a... Of, a, of an atom. So here we have the nuclei. Well, what happens in a metal? Because the way metals are designed is instead of holding on to their electrons like diamond does or rubber or others, instead of holding on to electrons and keeping them in place, metals are kind of like a giant community where all the parents have come together and they've tossed all of their kids into the same building and said, hey, let's all take care of them at the same time. It's kind of like a big family. Okay, so you have these nuclei, which are all inside this metal, and you have the electrons, which are all tossed in, and they're free to move wherever they want to go. And because they are free to move, there's greater atomic movement. Because there's greater atomic movement, there's, they allow energy to flow, and because energy flows, metals are great conductors, great conductors of energy. They're great conductors. So the electrons literally are free to move. They're like, hey, Giorgio, how's it going? Hey, come on over. All right, I'm coming on over. Okay. Whereas in like wood, for instance, it might be, hey, Giorgio, how's it going over there? I can't move. My hands are tied down. I'm stuck to this chair. Okay. And I can just wiggle a little bit. And that's about it. So metals allow this free movement. And because of the free movement, they allow energy to flow. This is conduction. This is how we move energy from one side to another. This is how heat is transferred through contact. This can happen on a stove. This could happen just if you touch a wall. Okay? This could happen if you go outside and the air is really cold. Your body's atoms actually have more energy. So when, and this is why you would get cold if you stood outside without a coat on. Your body is going to collide with the air particles when it's really cold. It's going to heat up the air around you, and in the process, you're going to lose energy. <laughs> and as a result, you would lose energy, you would get colder, and sometimes if you get too cold, you actually develop a really severe condition called what? Hypothermia. Hypothermia. 